So church, our main text right here, I'm really going to be focusing one verse, John 17, 3, which is what I read right there at the end. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. But I want to ask you, what is the good life? I want, to, I want you to think of in your mind, what's the good life? Right? Does anyone want to live for the bad life? Anybody? If you raise your hand, I'll give you 20. Just kidding. But you're not. None of you are wanting to live the bad life. You don't want your kids to live a bad life. You especially can't contemplate having to be the recipient of living a bad life. Nobody wants to live a bad life. doesn't matter what you believe. Nobody is intending to live a life that is not worth living. But if I ask you the question, at least, church, I think... And, 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 I'm, and, I, and hopefully here, your first response is going to try to be biblical, right? You're, gonna, you're hopefully going to think, all right, I, I know if I answer any question, I need to think of Scripture in order to build my case for what the good life is. But I'm not even intending to ask you for the biblical answer. Church, listen, apart from the biblical answer that you may know how to give, what does your heart say? If I ask you, what's the good life? What does your heart first say rather than what you know what to say? And you know what I'm talking about. Everybody in here knows exactly what I'm talking about. The desires of your heart well up like a spring of water. And the minute that there is not something holding it down, it, it comes out. And so when you think, I want to live the good life. I know you have things deep in your heart that just come out. It, you, you want this, or you want that, or you want your life to be a certain way, or you want your life to be this way. And then, then I would live the good life. If I had this, this perfect display of my life, this circle of my life where everything's in there, everything's intact, everything's whole. But brethren, let me ask you the question is, who's defining who lives that good life? Who gets to say, that's the good life? You? And I want us to think about that because, brethren, one thing I don't want us to ever be confused about as Christians is that becoming a Christian means I don't live a good life. I just live a miserable, dreadful religious life where I put on 20-pound religious boots and I just got to lift them up one by one every single day, just plodding along in life, doing Christianity. That's not Christianity. It's not, brethren. Jesus Christ says He came to give life abundant. But we need to understand that Jesus Christ is also the one who told us what that life is going to be like. So I've entitled my sermon today, The Good Life. Because brethren, I want you to be absolutely convinced that the Bible does hold out a good life for you, but that it is probably entirely different than anything you can imagine in your own heart and anything that the world could conjure up for you. The good life is much better than what God says, than what the world says. And it's much better than what you say. It's much better than what the desires of your heart say. So the way I want to answer that question and that purpose, what is the good life, is to ask you another question. I love asking questions up here. And that is this. What's eternal life? What is eternal life? John 3.16. Right? I don't know how I'm back to John 3.16 again. I just am. Third week in a row. But for God so loved the world that what? So that whoever believes in Him should have eternal life. Everybody in here better be banking on that verse for their life. If I ask you, why are you a Christian? And you have any other answer besides, I have trusted in Christ for eternal life. Your answer is bunk. It's void. It's meaningless. But if you hold on to that answer, it's everything. But the question becomes is, what is the eternal life that you were promised as a Christian? What I mean, it, that, that is actually, I think in my mind, that's actually a hard question. It seems so easy because it is an easy verse to remember. And I want you to remember that verse. But it's also a hard question to answer because we haven't really given a whole lot of thought to what is the kind of life that God in Christ has not only won for us, 
but it has caused you to now experience. Right? Eternal life, though it is something you look forward to in the future, as, as, as we sung in all those songs, all those songs were picked on purpose, talking about having Christ, having life, being with Him forever, right? On that final day when sin and death are no more. But yet we understand the reality of this. Jesus Christ first and foremost defines eternal life as knowing God. And, and church, do we know God? I hope everyone would say, yes, I do know God because I know Jesus. So the, 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 the point then is this. If you know God, you right now experience eternal life, which should, should press the, 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 the importance of this question on you even more is if I'm experiencing a life that God won for me in Christ now, then what is it, right? Be, because like John Piper is so famous for saying, you don't want to waste your life. If you've been given eternal life, then it would seem that we are under a weight of, uh, of obligation to be able to say then, what's the life we ought not to waste that we've been given? If God has won for us eternal life, then I don't want to waste it. And I don't want to think little of it. I don't want to get to heaven one day and then I'm caused to think about the life that's been won for me. I want to think about it now because I know God now and God says I have eternal life now. So we need to answer that question. So we're going to do this in two parts. We are just going to break down eternal life. I want to, I want to break it down in, into, into just that of separating from that word eternal in life to understand what it is for Jesus to say that this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and he concludes himself in that Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So that's how we're going to answer this question. We're going to break it down. I want to discuss what does it mean, all right, let's English lesson here really quick, right? Uh, what is eternal? Right? Is anyone taking Greek? Right? Syntax question coming in here. How is eternal functioning in the phrase eternal life? What is it doing to life? Anybody? Okay, it's, it's attributing something to the life. It's modifying the word. What kind of life? It's eternal. Right? That's, so the, the word is, is, is describing to you the kind of life given to you. And the first thing that we got to talk about then is Okay, what does it mean that the life is eternal? What does that even mean, right? Does that just mean forever and ever? I mean, that's not a bad answer, but is that it? And then we can answer the second question. If it's eternal, what kind of life do we experience in eternity? What, what does that look like? What is the kind of life that we are to have? And I think in answering both those questions, church, we're going to answer our initial question is, what is the good life? And I'm going to tell you the simple answer that we'll unpack is the good life is eternal life. And that's it. That's the only good life is eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's the only good life to live. That's the only good life to have. That's the only good life that's experienced is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So let's start with this first point right here. Eternal. That this life that you have as a Christian is everlasting. So everyone understands that concept, but you can't really comprehend it in its fullness, right? It's, it's, the, it, it, it's the brain melt of thinking, I'm going to live forever. And then you, you think about it too long and it just hurts, right? You're gonna, what, everything in your life has time. We got the church, hopefully on time. We're going to hopefully get done at a certain time. I'm going to go home and rest for a certain amount of time. We're going to the steals at a certain time. Everything has, I, I am fixed in time as a creature. I, I live by time. To not live with time, I mean, we would just, everything would be chaotic. It would, everything would fall apart. We are creatures of time. So oh, for us, think eternal life, everlasting life. Like, I, I understand what the concept is, but to really comprehend all of it. That is something in which you just have to embrace as a Christian 
of, of there's mystery to that, brethren. Well, I don't, I don't know how to explain that to you. But to simply say, what, what does eternal mean? It means unending. It means everlasting. It means life that does not cease to be. It is life and no death. Right? Just unending life. And I want you to see here in John, because as I have been in John, and as we read verses in John, I want you to see how John reveals to us two things by saying eternal. This is important. Let's not, let's, let's not Christianize things in the Bible and truncate them, and, and that way we've created eternal, yeah, forever, put it on my Christian theological you know, dresser, and I'll just look at it every once in a while because it's nice to remember eternal. I got that word down. I want you to reconsider some of the implications of the fact that your life is eternal. But I want you to hear how Jesus does it. So you can flip through these passages. I'm going to give them all to you. It's just going to be in John. I want to stay in John because John has this driving theme to tell you what life is. The good life is. So once again, we are starting John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have what? Eternal life. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on Him. John 4, 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from life or from death to life. John 6, 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. John 6, 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. John 10, 28. I give them eternal life. He's talking about his sheep. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Last one in our text again, John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Brethren, listen, John here is contrasting Almost in every example, not in every sentence, but if you go back into every single context of eternal life, he is trying to show you how radical it is to say life eternal and also how serious this kind of life ought to be taken. Every time John talks about eternal life, what is the contrasting parallel with it death there is life to be had and there is also a death to be had if you do not take that life there is eternal life and there is condemnation there is life from the sun and there is also judgment to be had and eternal death to be experienced if not taken and John is doing that in purpose, on purpose, brethren, to tell you just how radical this idea of eternal life is and how seriously, listen, how seriously the disciples and the people listening ought to hear all of the promises regarding eternal life because it's always paired with something else. Eternal life, in order to understand how good the good life is, you must always hold it up to the bad life. You must hold it up to what the life will look like that does not cling to Jesus Christ and receive everlasting life. But I want this first to be instructive for you. 
listen, I, I, I think there is an encouragement here, and there's a couple of things before we get to the seriousness and the radicalness of this, is this. The encouragement for us when we first think about the kind of life that Jesus gives us is that He gives you eternal life. Brethren, it's like Augustine said, within the heart of every single being is the longing for eternity. Nobody, if pressed at the end of their life with a gun to their face, facing the uncertainty of death, maybe with their lips, but not with their heart, would deny the reality that they know that as they pass, yet it will not be the end for them. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what any atheist says. In the heart of every human being is stamped with eternity. Everybody knows that the life that we live now is representative of a life that is going to come. Everybody knows it. And for us, brethren, this ought to encourage us that Jesus Christ is going to give us eternal life where our life does not cease in some way. It's a life that does not end. And listen, this is the beauty of coming unto Jesus Christ is that this life that Christ gives you when it is called eternal is not some half-measured-out life that some half-measured-out deity gives to you like in Mormonism or like in Jehovah's Witnessism. Whatever it may be, it is not half-measured-out to you. Jesus Christ is not a wimpy Roman Greek God. He is the God who gives eternal life. He is powerful. He's not even like the superheroes who everybody loves to watch today, where their power and their might and their strength last maybe right up until the end, and yet they need somebody to come and still help them. They need some kind of external power outside of themselves to help save the day. And not Jesus Christ. He doesn't need a band of heroes to display real power or to produce life. He's not in search of it. He doesn't need an ancient formula that will allow Him the ability to either give you life or sustain your life. Church, the life of which Jesus offers ought to speak to you the kind of Messiah that you have. One in which you can't even imagine. Your imagination is too weak to think of Jesus Christ and the life that He gives your imagination is weak. But you can bet that your Messiah, to whom gives you life, will give you what He says. Because Jesus Christ says, I will give you Myself. No other God throughout all of history has ever done or ever said what Jesus Christ says to you. How do you know Jesus Christ will give you an eternal life? Brethren, because He gives you Himself. That's how you know. Jesus Christ comes and says, I'll guarantee it, I'll give you me. He is eternal life, as He says. He is the eternal Son who is able to give to all of God's sons everlasting life. And the source is able to give the sustenance that it promises because it's able to produce it. Your God is able to give you eternal life because He is it. He doesn't need to build it. He doesn't need to make it. He doesn't need to outsource it. And so you can be confident that the eternal life Jesus Christ gives is eternal because brethren, He's eternal. He is the source. He is, as Colossians says, whom and through whom and for whom all things were made. He is the source. And therefore, Christian, you will live forever because Jesus Christ lives forever. You will have life without end, worshiping that God. Amen. That is your instruction here. But I also want you to think then of just how radical the claim is, not even in Jesus' own day, but in your own day. Right? The Word of God comes, and what does the New Testament say all of Scripture was written for? It was written for you. It was written on account for you. So you need to think the next, how radical the contrast of that promise, of that instruction for you, Christian, how radical of a departure that 
is with our culture in which we now abide in and live in, where ideas of eternal things are just as about as real as the Avengers or whatever you watch at the movies. They seem like fables of lost ages, right? To speak about eternal things. And brethren, it's because Darwinism and secularism have all but sucked the life out of our culture. One in which was Christian. One in which was blessed by God at some point. One in which God sustained for quite some time. And now we are trying to sustain ourselves like a flower out of its pot. Brethren, Darwinism and secularism have shadowed a reality that the Christian church literally basked in for over a millennia. And we don't think about this. We, 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 we forget this, but we still see it in the things that we remember from our own cultural heritage. You think of things that Christians built. You think of things that Christians made. You think of something as nice as a bound Bible and the beauty of it. In everything that you've inherited from buildings to art to music to culture to politics to law, all these things that have beauty and intricacy from them were built on the, the, the foundational principle that there is an eternal God and there are eternal structures within the world, eternal laws that ought to be obeyed and can't be denied, and that you as a being will live for eternity. Those things drove our culture. And now, life is merely what? It's a byproduct. It's simply an accident of evolution and mutation mixed together with random processes and whose end is what? Death. Every time. It's always death in Darwinism and secularism. And the eternal is not just something then that is lost for us. Brethren, for us, even as Christians in our context, to think of the eternal is kind of an absurd reality to think of. We think of here and now because our culture lives in here and now. And it's not simply because of practical matters we live in the here and now. It's because our culture thinks the here and now is all that matters. If there is no eternal God, there is no eternal fixed principles in the universe. If you are not an eternal being, then the here and now should be the only things that matters. Why give yourself to those silly thoughts? But to live forever... In light of that culture, what does that mean? What's it even for? Because, brethren, look around you. Look around you what of our culture has built. Because you look at around things, like I said, and you compare it to things of the past, you realize that what you think about eternity literally impacts every area of your life. Everything you do is impacted by eternity. And if you don't think so, think about this. You, what, are, what are some of the oldest buildings in Western culture? They're churches. They're monasteries. They're, they're, there are monuments even to false gods, right? They're, they're, there are all these things because there were fixed principles and an idea of eternity embedded within the human heart that guided people for such a long time that even the things they built seemed to last forever. The things that they made, their ideas, their culture, their everything seems to be propagated through those people because they thought that way, and especially within Christianity. And brother, now what do you see? Look at what's built now. How long does it last? Buildings tell of the thoughts of eternity. The architecture is not neutral. Look at this place. It is no monastery from the 13th century, though I am grateful for it, brother, and it is quite ugly. And that's okay. Praise the Lord for a building, but brethren, it is not built with beauty in mind because it is not looking to the eternal God to see what beauty is. It doesn't care about the eternal. Brethren, people build with the worldview and it's displayed in it. Look to art. Look at what comes out of our art now. Meaninglessness. Everybody interprets it because what eternal principle is fixing what makes art good and not good? Music good and not good. Brethren, I could come up here and scratch the chalkboard and drop a pen and call that music and there would be people in this world that would applaud and give me money for that because they just think, wow, 
the, the depths of, of thought that that took, the originality, but there's nothing guiding it, nothing eternal, nothing fixed. And brethren, think about this, modern science and politics. The guiding assumptions in science now are radically different than what prompted science in its original origins. Because brethren, the church was the birthplace of science. The church was the birthplace of all of these different things, of producing Western culture and law, of producing uh, all this great art, of producing all these political ideas of which you still live on the lingering effects now. And now we have politics that are only guided by ends justifying the means, but never actually producing the results that it promises. We have politics that are guided by short-term realities because there is no long-term reality. There is no eternal end. There is no goal. There is no telos. It's power grabs. It's corruption. It's extortion. And whatever political garbage that you can think of, brethren, it comes from the fact that we have not viewed image bearers as eternal beings created by God. And if all human government is, is the summation of all those different things, governed by reason, governed by chance, governed by mutation, with the end that everything just dies, then there's no purpose. There's no value. There's no eternality to it. And then listen, brethren, behold your modern day society. And let me ask you, how great of a Savior in God is that? I want you to think, brethren, in your context, how radical the idea of an eternal God giving eternal life for an eternal end actually is to a world that thinks we are here and then we're gone. How radically different would we be and stand out Two people who think that compared to thinking we will live forever and we will either live forever with God or without Him. Brethren, what you think about the span and time of life, where you think it's going, is going to shape how you view and ultimately how you value that life. So brethren, when Jesus comes and says, I come to give eternal life, that's radical. It's a radical thing, not only then, but it's a radical thing for us now. But here is what gets to the heart of Jesus' words and I think John's gospel. Brethren, this is the one that ought to sober us up about the seriousness of Jesus Christ saying eternal life. Not only is the idea of eternal life getting down to the root of the kind of life that Jesus offers you, but it also is going to, review to reveal to you the gravity of the situation in which not only we find ourselves, but the rest of the world finds themselves. Brethren, if Jesus Christ has to come in and offer eternal life, what's the contrast? Why does life need to be given that is eternal? Did not Jesus, as, as, as He comes on and fulfills all righteousness, He places Himself under the wrath of God and die for the sins of His people? Does He just come to do that so that there's a nice heavenly option? Right? You can have eternal life. It's a great option to have. You'll never die. Right? It'll be great. It's, but it's not just that. No one in here should think that. It's not an option. Jesus Christ comes to give life and He's offering it to us because the fact is that the everlasting life assumes there is a need because there is a consequence if we do not possess that eternal life. And one that is dire. And one thing that we have got to affirm is the, etern the eternality of one's decision. You think about this, brother. We're talking about an eternal God, eternal life, eternal people. And lo and behold, what you do with eternal life as that decision is an eternal decision. The, the kind of irony in that. God is sort of funny in that way, but funny to kind of sober you up to think, what you do with that eternal life will have an eternal effect because it's an eternal decision. We've got to affirm that. Jesus stands clear and says, if you come to me, I'll by no means cast you out. You will have eternal life. Brethren, take that check and take it to the bank. 
But so is the promise of failure to do just this. If Imagine Jesus' statement to just kind of really dampen the mood, right? <laughs> Instead of all you come to me who are heavy laden and, and weary and I'll give you rest. Imagine him saying something more along the lines of, if you will not come to me weary and heavy laden, I will give you no rest. If you will not come, you will in very certain terms be cast out. And the consequence of not coming to Jesus is not a lesser weight than the reality of eternal life. Then denying Him is not somehow lesser in its consequence as, you, as if you're going to receive a lesser penalty than the reward you would receive by accepting Him. Let me try to explain that to you. Right? If Jesus Christ offers eternal life and you deny it, the punishment and the result and the consequence of your decision is not less than the fact that you would gain eternal life. It's on par with it. If you don't take eternal life, the consequence is, oh, you just kind of missed out on a really great option. The consequence is eternal death. If you push off Jesus Christ as the only source of eternal life, the consequence resulting from it is equal to the gift. It's eternal death. It's eternal damnation. It is eternal separation. It is eternal torment. Eternal judgment. And brethren, listen. Some have tried to avoid that reality that the New Testament does not reveal this. That instead it reveals people rejecting Christ by making the case that the New Testament either offers you eternal life or everlasting life for the righteous, but then if you don't take that, you just cease to be, right? And that's exactly an example of what I'm getting at, is it's not parallel or equal to the life given in the gift. So if you don't accept the gift, you will be given something. But they're making the claim that the thing you get is actually lesser than the gift given. The gift is eternal life, but the result of not taking it is, well, you just cease, right? There's nothing eternal to that. You just, you're done, right? You, 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 you get judged. You literally perish. Poof. You're gone in an instant, right? You're, you're like the built bar ate this morning. It was gone quick, not to return. But brethren, listen, they view the judgment and consequence as something lesser than the gift given. And we need to ask ourselves, not do we react to that, but what does Scripture say? Because we don't want to hold a tradition in here about damnation because our evangelical tradition loves to preach damnation and hellfire. I want to turn to Scripture and say, is that accord with Jesus Christ? And brethren, the answer is going to be no. Because John in his gospel makes zero provision for this and the rest of the New Testament makes absolutely no provision for a lesser degree of punishment than the gift given itself. The roads, they stand on equal footing as far as what they can offer, how long they will offer it. They're both everlasting. But one is obviously to the joy and for your benefit, and the other one is to your detriment and to your misery and your torment. So, brethren, what I want you to think of then is this, because the hard part comes in trying to fit all this into one sermon, which I'm not going to be able to do because I would like to be under an hour and 15 minutes. But when you look at the Old Testament, what you never see in there is Jesus Christ coming in out of nowhere and saying, yeah, those people who just got judged, yep, they just went off to everlasting punishment. You know what? You don't have that. Let's just be honest about the Old Testament. But the question you should ask yourself is the Old Testament... Is the Old Testament made to tell you that truth that you get in the New Testament? I'm going to say no. The Old Testament is, is what it's doing is painting, and I've talked about this a million times, it is painting for you pictures over and over again that are slightly similar but with slightly different shades of color to show you a pattern of something that is to come. But every time we reach the end of that pattern in the New Testament, it's always greater every single time. Let me give you an example. The Old Testament always promises life to God's people if they obey Him in the land. Amen? 
should amen that. Now that principle does get dragged into the New Testament, but is it just land anymore? No, it's not a plot of land. And is the life simply just an age of life as long as you live? No, it gets transformed. And brethren, in the same way, we look at the Old Testament, and one of the challenges for us to think of is in the Old Testament, all it ever talks about is people being wiped out. They come in, Amalekites, wiped out. David comes in and he starts routing out, uh, he, start, he starts writing out Philistines, right? Boom, get them out of here. Right, people, people come up from Eden or Moab and they try to invade, boom, wiped out, right? They just start, they start putting people away. They perish, they cease, they go down to the pit, they seem to be gone. So you don't, you don't really get this unpacking of what actually happens to people until you reach the New Testament. But make, make it clear, brethren, a, a principle we have established for you, the new interprets the old. We don't understand death and life after death according to what we only have in the Old Testament. It helps, but we help understand that by the, by the, the glasses of the New Testament, understanding what was being pictured in the Old Testament as people were judged. And what it was picturing, brethren, was the ultimate judgment. Every single judgment in the Old Testament anticipates a final judgment of God Himself when all the wrongs are made right and all the evil are judged and all the righteous are vindicated. So here's, here's how this gets dragged into the New Testament. And I think without a shadow of a doubt, I can read you these, these passages and to convince you of the other gravity of what happens if you reject Jesus Christ and eternal life. Here's the first one. I'll give you these texts, but I'm just going to read them because I have a, a lot to read. First, in John, he speaks of, uh, of this death, and he alludes to this in his condemnations of the Pharisees in John 8.24. He says to them, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Okay, so John says, you don't trust in Jesus for eternal life. It means you're clinging on to sin and you will die in those sins. What does that mean? And I think John has already clarified what does it mean to die in sin? Does it mean to just perish and cease? I don't think so. John earlier in John 5 seems to see two things. One, the result of dying in your sins means that it will result in your resurrection to punishment. He's going to tie those two things together. Dying in sin means you will continue to live after you die, but not in a good way. If you die in sin, it is not an eternal life that we have not even defined yet. Rather, there is a life that will be given to you, but it will be one of judgment. And there's what he says in John 8, or excuse me, John 5, 28, 29. He says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good, listen, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. I'll just say a, a better, another phrase, eternal life. The resurrection to eternal life. And those who have done evil, to what? To nothing? No. To the resurrection of judgment. So you have a resurrection of these people, but to judgment, they don't cease they rejected the life eternal, and they still received life eternal, but they didn't receive the kind of life that Jesus gives. They're going to receive a different kind of life, and it's going to be one marked by judgment. And then Paul here in Acts, as he delivers the gospel of the kingdom of God towards the end of Acts, he's talking to the Gentiles, and he makes known what he thinks the end is. Right, what I keep saying, the telos, the goal, the end of this gospel is. And he says this, Acts 24, 15. He says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that, here we go, there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Another way to think about that, those who have believed 
in Jesus for eternal life, and those who have not and who will perish. They will be resurrected, but to a different life. And John in Revelation speaks it in this way. John says this, And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke, listen, this is the same people, this word following right here, follow. And the smoke of their torment, the people being judged, does what? Goes up forever and ever, and they, listen, they have no rest. Day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name, Revelation 14, 9 through 11. So notice right there, John, later on in Revelation, just continuing that thread in the Gospels and from Paul in Acts and in other epistles, saying that the ones whom God's wrath is poured out on, the ones who receive it, the cup of His anger, they are tormented, and the smoke of their... Listen, not the smoke necessarily of the judgment, as if it's the remains of something that was once there. It is that their torment is personified. Brethren, it's as if their torment continually, continually, and continually rises up as a signal that God is continually out pouring judgment on them forever. Because it says they have no rest. Day and night, there ceases to be rest of the torment that they suffer by the outpouring of God's own wrath. And their torment, brethren, is personified to make you sober-minded. It does not end. They did receive the fruit of their works. It is an eternal something, but it is not the eternal life that Jesus offers, brethren. This is an eternal judgment, an eternal reckoning, an eternal condemnation. And at the end, we see the exact same thing. John says again, Then I saw a great white throne, and Him who was seated on it, and from His presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Listen, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Brethren, listen to me. Listen. As you consider the eternal life that Jesus gives to you, as you proclaim that eternal life to people, brother, do you remember this? It is possible for those people and for yourself, if you do not believe, you can die a second time. You may think that when you die, it is all over. It is not. There is a far greater death to be experienced after you die. There is a life to be experienced after you die that will be but a worse death than your own physical death. Brethren, if your name's not found there in the book of life, you are thrown into the lake of fire, which is called the second death. And from there you will experience the almighty wrath of God forever and ever. So brethren, listen. When Jesus says that He comes to give eternal life in that context, it is held up with that very same kind of warning in the same kind of contrast. Don't be fooled that it, people say that if you don't trust in Christ, you will simply cease to be, or whatever nonsense people want to get around all those passages. 
It is displayed for you in the scriptures that Jesus is only giving two options. There are no more options, brethren, in this life. There are none other. One leads to an eternal life of joy in Christ. You have Him. But there is a life. There is one in one, there is a life in which one looks and can say, listen, that is the kind of life I want. It's abundant. There, yeah, when you look at it, there's life there, there, there's vitality there, and there's Jesus there. And that's how I know that that is eternal life. But there's also another life in which if you were to look at and contrast it, you would look at it and say, at that place, there is nothing but death. Death lies there. That kind of life, that eternality is nothing but one of death. And brethren, apart from Jesus Christ, that is the path every single person is on. Not will go down, but is on and will finish when they die. And that second death will be much worse than the first. So brethren, if there is the reality then in Scripture of eternal, then what is the reality then of the kind of life that we ought to be looking for? Because the thing you should be thinking now in your mind then is, okay, everyone lives. So technically, in one sense, there's a general eternal life everybody has. Everybody will end up living forever. So this, I think, help flows into my second point nice because now when we're talking about life, what I want to get out of your minds is this, because I think this is what we think of in our context when we think of eternal, right? You believe in Jesus, and He says, I'll give you eternal life, and it's all of a sudden like a cord was attached to you. And then that cord gets plugged into a power outlet, and now you've got everlasting life, right? As long as you're plugged into that outlet, you just never die, right? And, and so eternal life is this very minimalistic barren kind of thing where all it is is I live forever. That all life is is living for eternity. But brethren, that's not eternal life. There is a truth to that. You will live forever one way or the other. Brother, when Jesus Christ says that He offers eternal life, He's not just offering you the hope that your power will never be shut off. That your heart will never just simply stop beating. That your eyes will never close. He is offering not just a quantity of life, though He is. It is eternal, everlasting, never ending. He is offering you something far more important. And I think something that if it doesn't qualify this, makes eternal life meaningless. And that is the quality of life that He offers. And that's what we need to see here when we're talking about the eternal life that Jesus gives. It is not just live forever, endeavor, 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 endeavor. Because, brethren, you can go look at, you can go watch any movie or read any book, and this central problem is dealt with in all of them. If any of you have ever seen The Lord of the Rings and you think of the elves, right? The, the elves are living forever, and yet it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a life that has no end, Right? It, it, there is no end to this life. And you, and you see throughout the, the, the story of Lord of the Rings how some elves will actually give up their eternality in order to die because it gives them purpose. Because now there's an end. There's, there's, a, there's a quality now given to their life because they know that life's not going to be forever. But brethren, what Jesus Christ does is He takes eternity and He takes life and He puts them together and He says that your eternal life will have an ultimate end because it will have an ultimate purpose. Wanting to live forever will not make you a Christian. Telling somebody that your sins be, can be forgiven so that you don't die will not change the wretched sinner's heart. What they must see in eternal life is what Jesus says in John 17, 3. That this is eternal life. You want to live forever? Well, do you want this? Do you want to know the only true God and of Jesus Christ whom He sent? Because, brethren, if that's not the answer, then to hell with eternal life. 
it's meaningless apart from the one in whom gives it and the one who is the life. What do I experience in eternal life? I experience God. Not living forever, but God. And in, in experiencing God, brethren, I will live forever. But I will live the kind of life that I was made and meant to experience. And this is the thing that I want you to meditate upon today. That the type of life being offered to you is one of a quality so great and so beyond what you can think life is that this kind of life is so grand that it's to be given to you to be enjoyed because what you are getting is God. And I know that's a weird thing to hear. Because, brethren, just be honest with yourselves. You don't know what living means. I don't care how old you are in here, how much experience you have, or how little experience you have, or what you've done in your life. You just don't know what living means, and I don't either. None of us have been able to look at our lives and to put in a bottle distilled life. Living. Living for the thing that gives you purpose. Because what happens to every person that tries to distill the meaning of life apart from Jesus Christ? They never distill it. They're always grasping at something. Even people who look like they have it. Even people who seem like they got the good life. And for you, the good life is probably a well-paying job, lots of money, ability to travel whenever you want to, having all the things that you want, never being in need. And brethren, yet, that is not life. Because eternal life has nothing to do with all the stuff that you accumulate and all the stuff that you could have. Brethren, if you could live eternally in heaven and be fed all that you could eat and be given all that you could take and rest as long as you wanted to, you would never be satisfied. Believe that now. Because here is the great lie that you can find life in anything else besides Jesus Christ is that it deceives. Brethren, you have looked people in the eye. You yourself may have been the person so deceived in thinking, Oh, I, got, I have it. Why else would I want Jesus Christ? And you're a fool because you've been deceived by the thing in front of you. It really has deceived you. You really think you have made the life, that you have it, that you got it into a bottle. But then when you die and you realize that nothing that you have is life, that nothing that you have carries any weight into it because you don't have God and you don't have Jesus Christ. Brethren, the, the facade of the deception as it melts away will be your torment. I don't know everything that hell is, brethren. I don't. And the Bible does not go into great depths to talk about the horrors of it, but listen to, listen to me, brethren. If eternal life is enjoying God, then brethren, hell must be the place where all the things in which you thought you found life, and joy, and peace, quietness in, is the place where you are frustrated by the fact that you are no longer given that. Brother, I want you to imagine that, right? Because you all are people like me. Check your phone right now. See when your Amazon package is coming. I know what wells up in your heart. It's funny, right? It's kind of funny. But what is built into you? You long for things, brethren. You long to be fulfilled by them. You do. You long to see that thing come into the mail. You long to see the thing that you desire within your heart get there. But then what happens the minute that you get it, brethren? It's gone. The thing you distilled is now no longer there because you thought you distilled it. And now the facade is gone and you realize you have nothing. Brethren, I promise you, it will be like that when it's all said and done. And you've got to distill that into your minds now because, brethren, listen, we have been deceived our whole lives. And we live in a culture which has deceived us, and we have believed it. And here's the thing. Why did you end up believing those promises? Because you were told it over and over and over and over again. And brethren, you have got to do this with this promise of eternal life, that the life that is worth having, and that the only place you can find it, and that the only place where life is meaningful is in Jesus Christ, you have got to tell yourself that over and over and over again. And when you see the lie, 
And when the feeling rises up inside of you that you would rather find it in something else, you have got to look at it with all of your being and say, that is a lie. Even when it's pulling at you, brethren, because I know it in my own heart. I was a slave to things. And it's because there was real joy to be found in it, but then it was fleeting and it wasn't life everlasting. And it deceived me because my God was cruel. It said, you can have it and it'll be great. And then they take it away. And your joy is gone. And your life is gone. And brethren, you don't want to get to the final day and God takes away the thing that you love the most. Imagine eternal frustration and you're grinding and gnashing of teeth at God because He no longer gives you what you want. That'll be part of your judgment. That'll be part of the world's judgment. You will not be able to go on in hell sinning like you want. You will be in hell suffering for loving something else more than God. And brethren, sinners in hell will be frustrated their whole life because they will not be able to party in hell. Hell will not be filled with people just getting to do what they did here for eternity. They will be removed from their gods to never enjoy something ever again, to never be satisfied, to never have anything feel or experience other than utter torment and punishment and longing because the thing that would have filled their longing they don't want. Brethren, I'm sure there's more than that in hell. But that sounds like hell enough. You never ever being satisfied. Never ever having joy. Always being frustrated. And everything always being taken away from you that you desire. So brethren, eternal life then is knowing God. And this is the profound point that sounds so simple. But the life that is to be had, that Jesus Christ went to the cross for, was so that you would experience life. And that that life would be you knowing God. And not just knowing Him here, brethren. Not, not, not just knowing Him intellectually. Not just knowing Him even through the Word. But, brethren, one day where not even the Word will be the thing necessary. We will be with Him. And brethren, I don't know how to distill that down. Because I can't cause your heart to look to the God who made you and to love Him. God does that. But brethren, just as you know the feeling of loving the thing you longed for, you know the feeling of when God and Jesus Christ was shed in your hearts and you longed for Him. And that will be the thing you are satisfied in the rest of eternity. And this is what Jesus died for. He went that your sins would be blotted out and remembered no more. And He went that life may once again be found and enjoyed. But the way that it's enjoyed is that it all relates to God. Because it all comes from Him. And this displays for us, brethren, what is the ultimate trade-off for us of what we are saved from. We are not just simply saved from being punished, brethren. We are saved from not enjoying God. We are saved from that. So brethren, here I want to give you a last few things. A couple of points right here at the end. Because if this is the life, like the psalmist says, that God's face shines upon him and he rejoices in everything greater than even wine or grain could offer him. Here is how you can begin to cultivate that. And I want you to look to Jesus Christ in order to see how he cultivated that. Brethren, here's how I know you can live the good life and experience it. Because Jesus Christ lifts His eyes up to heaven and prays to His Father for His people that God would be glorified in Him on the worst night of His life. How will you cultivate the good life? Jesus was not looking at the cross going, the bad life is before me. Hardship was before him, yes. But he knew, I go to the cross, and what does he say? It says, Father, I have glorified you. Now glorify me. Give me the, glor give me the good life that I have secured, which is your glory. I've glorified you. 
I have found my life within you. Now glorify me. And he also calls for his people to be glorified along with him. So brethren, Jesus Christ is experiencing the good life and the moment of agony and of most distress in his entire life on earth. And he prays. Brethren, listen. I know we talk about prayer all the time. Do not miss this point though. You will never, never, ever cultivate the good life if you don't pray. Never. I'm not even talking about getting things by asking God for things, which is true. I'm not even talking about just being obedient and praying to the Father in the Son's name. And I'm not just talking about showing up so that you could even pray for others, which is also a good and biblical thing. Brethren, you won't taste of the life that you have in Jesus because you have Him if you do not pray. The thing that you receive when you pray is the actual communion of you with God and you saying, I love that. Which is why the psalmist can say, I would rather spend one day, just one, if I had one, one day in your courts as a doorkeeper, the lowest person in the temple, than rather spend a thousand days in tents full of wickedness, brethren, is because they want to commune with the God whom they have tasted of, they've experienced, of whom life is enjoyed and found. And brethren, you have got to find that in prayer. That is how Jesus found it in the garden at His worst. And brethren, if you can't find it in your best, you won't find it in your worst. You won't know how to. You've never cultivated it. You've never done the work to cultivate the good life. And you've never communed with Him. So brethren, the second then is this. Prayer, but also you have got to begin to reorient your thinking. You have got to start telling yourselves the truth of Scripture about what real life looks like. Because church... Becoming a Christian does not mean that the old life goes away and the new life just becomes easy. We're not in eternity yet. Your heart still longs for sinful things. I know it because mine does. So don't be a fool to think, oh, I've become a Christian, that just won't happen again. It will. You've got to reorient your thinking by the Bible in the same way that the devil oriented your thinking as you were a slave. How do you get a slave to obey? You beat him into submission. Brethren, how will you begin to obey as a slave of Christ? You must beat the Word of God into your mind until you submit to it, not only in your head, but in your heart. You've got to do it. It has got to be a battle waged. The good life is cultivating by not sipping back and enjoying the good life already. It's to cultivate the good life that you would make it to the end to enjoy the fullness of that life. So you have got to begin to reorient your life to those truths. So when sin comes up, men, when the woman comes across your eyes, when she's, when she's beautiful and pretty, or when the internet is your temptation, you look at it, and even though it pulls at you, you go, that's a lie. And I'm not giving myself to the lie, because it'll end in death. It'll end in misery. I will give myself to the thing that though I don't even taste of it right now, I will cling to it because Christ Himself says He is it. Reorient yourself to that. Ladies, reorient yourself to those truths that when you think that what you have been told to look pretty, to sound pretty, to, to be a certain way, to act a certain way, to have a certain thing, Listen, ladies, everybody has their own temptations in here, and you still need to look in the face of those temptations and to say to hell with those things, because that's where they're going. Those temptations to, to, to orient yourself towards the world will be in hell, and you want to cast them off so that you don't go with it. Reorient yourself to the Bible. Let it be the thing that always captures your mind. And brethren... Lastly, even though I have more, I want you to know this one. Jesus gives us this principle. Though He is talking about Himself here, I think He gives us this principle that you are going to have to imbibe that is absolutely counterintuitive to the way that you think. 
This is John 12. Jesus says and answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Brilliant, right? The Son of Man glorified. And I'm thinking, Daniel 7, coming in for the win again, because I love Daniel 7. Always coming in and seeing the exalted Messiah. But that's not how Jesus first views His glorification. What hour has come upon Him in John 12? His crucifixion. And He says, that hour is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. 24, truly, truly, listen, amen, amen this church, because Jesus is amening it for you right here. Amen, amen, right? I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Brethren, you want to cultivate the good life? Die. Go and die. Bury yourself in the ground and bear the fruit of death. But not the death that is eternal. Not the one that is of punishment, brethren, but the one of resurrection. Go and die. Imbibe the principle. If I want to cultivate the good life and live and experience it, I will die to myself. Those desires in the ground every time. That world dead and in the ground every single time. Brethren, go and die to yourself. Imbibe what Jesus did, that you would be glorified in your dying so that you would be raised, bearing much fruit, and that you could say, I lived the good life. Brethren, let's pray.